Okay, maternal newborn and nursing. Today we're going to talk about chapter 13, the nursing assessment of a newborn. Okay, so what we're going to first look at is physiological adaptation. And this is going to be initially the respiratory system. So when you're thinking about a baby in utero, remember that he is not using his lungs at this point. They're filled with uh, fluid. The birth process, however, helps expel that fluid, helps expel any kind of fluid out. It stimulates surfactant production, and remember that surfactant is um, the stuff that opens up the lungs. It's a substance found in the lungs of mature babies. It keeps those alveolas from collapsing. Okay, and then it stimulates lung inflation. So remember that vaginal squeeze is going to squeeze out any of that excess fluid. It's also going to stimulate surfactant. And surfactant keeps those alveolas from collapsing after they first expand. If a baby was premature, they might actually give them shots of surfactant to help with lung maturation. Okay. Secondly, we're going to look at circulation through the heart. So the fetal circulation is a little bit different than yours and mine. Whenever they're in utero, remember, they aren't really having to use uh, their lungs. So they have three different shunts, which we will talk about. And those shunts just shunt the blood away. For example, the lungs. There is high pressure in the lungs because there's so much fluid there that it causes the... Um, blood whenever it comes to the lungs rather than going through the lungs and going through that process it doesn't need to at this point they're not using it they're getting their oxygen from the placenta so instead it shunts it on through and there's a, a ductus arteriosus which is from the pulmonary arteries it's a little bitty you can actually see it on this picture a little bitty shunt that makes it go from the pulmonary arteries can't do this for it here, pulmonary arteries up into the aorta and down throughout the rest of the body. So that is one shunt. The second shunt is going to be right here, and that is the foramen ovale, and it is through the atriums. Now think about a normal heart like yours and mine. Which side of the heart has the most pressure? And you said left. Very good. The left side. But for a fetus in utero, that is completely different. The right side has all the pressure. And so since the baby is not using his lungs, his or her lungs, that blood doesn't have to go through to the lungs. It just goes straight through this little ductus out to the left side of the atrium up into the aorta and down throughout the rest of the body. There's one more that we'll talk about and that is going to be in the liver and that is the ductus venosus. Now think about this baby. This baby is not having really to do anything on its own at this point. It has the mother to um, filter out all of the toxins and so the baby doesn't necessarily need to uh, circulate blood through the liver. They do just enough to keep it vital and working, but they're not having to actually use that. Same with the lungs. There's a little bit of blood going to the lungs to keep that tissue alive, but not as much as, say, you and I who have, have to use it to breathe. Okay, so fetal circulation. There's high pressures in the lungs that causes the pressure in the right atrium to be higher than the pressure in the left atrium. Okay, remember, everything for you and I is going to be a little bit backwards in this fetus while it's in the mother's stomach. As long as it has the placenta, giving it food, oxygen, nutrients, and um, taking care of its waste, it's going to be different than yours and my circulation. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, pressures differ, differences help root the blood. And so this is back to those... Um, the ducks, the, um, the three ducks that we're going to talk about, the foramen ovale, ductus arteriosus, and again, ductus venosus is going to be in the liver. So pressures different, the pressures differences help root that, the blood through. The differences are different than you and I. Okay, moving on. Away from non-functioning lungs, because 
the lungs don't need all that circulation like yours and mine. It just needs enough to keep that tissue alive. And then back into the general circulation throughout the rest of the body. Ductus venosus is going to shunt that fetal blood away from the liver and back into the body. Okay, so circulation through the heart. Birth means that these fetal shunts must close. So with the first breath, all of a sudden, all this pressure has changed and it reverses the pressure pressures in the atria, causing the foramen of valley to close. Okay, so picture it as kind of this, um, like a wall that the blood can still go through. Whenever the pressure stops though, those things seal off and it's no longer a shunt. That's in a normal baby. Of course, we'll talk about instances where um, it's not normal later on. But for right now, that's normal. It's going to shut off and that blood, the pressures, everything's going to change. All of a sudden, there will be more pressure on the left side of the heart, like yours and mine, than on the right side. And that all happens whenever we clamp that cord and that baby takes its first breath. Okay, so um, the first breath reverses pressures in the atrium, causes that foramen valley to close. It redirects blood to the lungs, so now they're actually going to use their lung. This increase in oxygen aids in closing the ductus arteriosus, and the ductus venosus close, and blood flows through the liver as well. Newborn circulation is going to be similar to adult circulation. Remember with fetus, it's completely backwards. Newborn is now similar to adults. Okay. So thermo -reg, this is huge with infants, and you're, this is why we swaddle them, this is why we keep a cap on them all the time. Thermal regulation is very, very important with babies, and we have to be very careful with them. Um, it's the physiological process of balancing heat production with heat loss and maintaining adequate body temperature. So a newborn has problems with therm thermoregulation. They're prone to heat loss. They don't have um, the muscles and the adipose tissue like we do to help produce heat. They have more skin ratio than adipose fat or muscle, so they can lose their heat easier to things like evaporation, conduction, convection, and um, one more, evaporation, said that one, conduction, convection, convection, that's the one it is, okay? So not readily, readily able to produce heat, and then they're vulnerable to cold stress. Now, something with a baby is they are not able to shiver. If you ever see a baby jittery, that is not because they're cold. It's They cannot shiver. They have things to help them with the, um, produce heat, but shivering is not one. For you and me, you'll see me all the time. I'm cold nature, so I'm always shivering and chattering my teeth. But babies do not have that re reflex. If they're jittery, it's going to be something neurological. It's going to be a low blood sugar, but it will not be because they're cold. Okay, so a newborn can lose heat in four different ways. It's conductive heat loss, heat loss by convection, evaporation heat loss, and radiation. And you will see right here on this picture um, what that looks like. Radiation, Think of a cold window, convection, a cool air, like air conditioning blowing over, evaporation, they're wet, we have to get them dry after that bath, or water vapors will carry that heat away, and then conduction, they're laying on a cold table, so their heat goes into that, okay? Um, with the newborn, you should see them in a flex position, they should always be up tight like this, and then um, we'll talk about burning brown fat. So brown fat is a one-time store for these babies. They have it often on the back of their neck, the nap of their neck, between their shoulder blades, their armpits. And what this is, is um, it's a one-time body fat thing. If they get cold, they can use those uh, brown fat stores. However, once it's gone, it's always gone and they can't get it back. Problem is, they don't have a way to warm up. That's why we are responsible for wrapping them up, swaddling them, and keeping a hat on them so that they do not lose any uh, heat. Okay. You saw that picture? Okay. So metabolic adaption, neonatal hypoglycemic. Okay, this occurs when the blood 
glucose falls below 50 uh, milligrams per deciliter or even lower than that. And so what you'll see with these babies is often a shrill cry. They'll um, have a real high pitch cry. It can also um, uh, hold on. Okay, so early signs of this is going to be jitteriness, poor feeding, listless, irritability. They're just not happy babies. They're very, very fussy. They'll have a low temperature, a weak or high pitch cry, and they won't have a good tone to them. They won't have that flex position that we want to see. And late signs, really late signs, are going to be respiratory distress, apnea, seizures, or coma. And that's why this is so important. If a baby can go in, goes into a coma because of a low blood sugar, that can cause long-term uh, brain damage. And so this is why we have to catch it early. If a baby is showing any of these signs, we need to be looking at that child and getting a glucose on them quickly, uh, seeing what his blood sugar is doing. Okay, so some of the risk factors that can come occur with this is inadequate fetal blood flow through the placenta. So for whatever reason, that placenta was not doing its job in getting that baby um, the adequate nutrients that it needed. Maternal diabetes, of course, if the mom has high blood sugars, high glucose all during the pregnancy, the baby gets used to that. And then whenever that supply is cut off, the baby's blood sugar, of course, can drop really quickly. Medications that can increase blood sugar taken by the mother, of course, prolonged labor, any kind of stress to that baby, maternal infection, respiratory distress, and cold stress. So those last two things are things that we really have to watch for. If the baby's in respiratory distress, we are going to be watching its blood sugar as well because it could cause a low blood sugar. Cold stress, the same thing. We have to keep those babies warm. Okay. So hepatic uh, adaption. Okay, so initially the baby's liver is very immature at birth. And so when we're talking about bilirubin, there's two different kinds of bilirubin. Conjugated bilirubin is water soluble and it's excreted in feces. So let's back up and let's talk about bilirubin. Now bilirubin is occurs whenever the red blood cells break down and you have these immature um, blood cells called uh, bilirubin. They're floating around and if it's conjugated that means that it can go to the liver. The liver can basically excrete it out in feces. That's conjugated. It's water soluble. The baby will just poop it out. However, if the baby has too much bilirubin, too much breakdown, and the liver is not able to get that conjugated, get it water soluble, and have them pass it through feces, it becomes fat soluble, unconjugated, and that's when you see it um, being exposed in the skin. You'll see it um, turn yellow and go to like skin, and that's when they become jaundice. Okay, so hyperbilirubinemia is high levels of unconjugated bilirubin in the bloodstream. So th this will be serum levels of four to six and greater. And then jaundice first appears on the head, so, and it progresses down in a cephalocaudal man manner. So when we're looking at how jaundiced a baby is, we're gonna start at the forehead, and you're gonna push on bony prominences to see how far it travels down. You'll press on the bones just because you can see more of the jaundice on it. And that's the way you know how far it goes. Does it go to the chest? Does it go to the abdomen? How far down does it go? Okay, so physiological jaundice. Jaundice is gonna be jaundice that occurs within the first 24 hours of life. Usually day two or day three or after birth. And then bilirubin levels that peak between days three and five, bilirubin levels that do not rise rapidly, no greater than five milligrams per deciliter per day. And then you have jaundice occurring within the first 24 hours of birth is gonna be considered pathological jaundice. Okay, so here's a picture of two babies um, before phototherapy and then one after. So you can just see on I can't point to it, never mind. You can see on that first one to the left how yellow their skin is, and then on the second, he doesn't look quite so yellow. And then on the picture below, that baby is getting treatment for um, 
uh, treatment with the billy light. And so anytime we give a baby treatment with a billy light, they're going to have goggles on, some kind of eye shield. They have to wear a diaper. You have to turn them every two hours. Okay. So hepatic, hepatic adaption. Okay, so a newborn cannot produce vitamin K. And to go through this, let's talk a little bit about, first, the gut is sterile. A baby has not had a bowel movement. They haven't had that chance to build up flora, and that makes that gut sterile. Well, your gut and my gut, we produce vitamin K because of that flora in it. But a newborn baby cannot produce vitamin K. So what does vitamin K do? do? It's part responsible for clotting factors. Okay, so let's go back. Liver is responsible for manufacturing clotting factors necessary for blood co uh, coagulation. However, a baby cannot produce vitamin K. Okay, there's several factors that require vitamin K in their production. And vitamin K is produced by bacteria that is normally found in the GI tract. However, newborn babies' guts are sterile, so they can't produce that vitamin K. So that is why when they first come out, we give them a shot of vitamin K. And that vitamin K is to prevent any kind of hemorrhaging with them. Okay. So newborns can't produce vitamin K. They can't produce some of the clotting factors. We give them a shot, aqua methylphenin, vitamin K. You'll give them IM. You'll see every baby gets this. Okay. Behavior and social adaptation. So with this, we're talking about the six sleep cycles. And the reason this one is kind of important is just when you're teaching parents, sometimes the bonding just isn't occurring and they're getting frustrated. They feel like their baby's rejecting them. But it's teaching them that um, the baby cries for certain reasons and the baby has certain sleep cycles. So you will see with almost every newborn this deep sleep. Now, granted, this isn't going to necessarily happen with those babies who are um, uh, drug babies, anything like that. They're obviously not going to really have this deep sleep. But the deep sleep is quiet, non-restless sleep, um, and it's hard to awaken them. For me, I can remember taking my newborn to sign papers on the house, and I had him in my arm, and he was just asleep on the table the entire hour that I'm signing papers. Nothing could disturb him, loud sounds. He was just out. Okay, that's an example of deep sleep. Obviously, this isn't when you're going to try and play with them or cool them. Light sleep, same thing. It's not the time where they're real interactive. Um, eyes are closed, but there is a little bit more no activity that is noted. You might see them move their extremities, have some sucking behavior. Drowsy, their eyes are open and closed, and their eyelids look really heavy. Okay, they're not going to want to play in this sleep state either. Quiet alert, this is probably a good time where they could play. Um, they have a little bit of body movement, newborn's eyes are open, he or she is attentive to people and things in close proximity and it's a good time for those parents to interact. Active alert, eyes are open, active body movements, newborn responds to stimuli with activity. And then you have, of course have crying, which we are all very familiar with. Even if you haven't had babies, you know a crying baby when you see one. So eyes might be tightly closed, thrashing movements are made in conjunction with active crying. And if a baby is doing this, we need to realize that there's something wrong with that child. He's trying to, he or she is trying to signal that something is going on.